Chapter Twenty Nine of Bob's A Girl Detective. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North. Chapter Twenty Nine Tragic Hours. And now, while these young people are having a carefree, happy time in the beautiful Orange Hill County, let us return to the east side that is sweltering in the heat of late June. It was nine o'clock at night, and the air was still breathlessly stifling. The playground that edged the East River was thronged with neighbouring folk who had brought what portable bedding they had, and who planned sleeping upon the ground out of doors to catch some possible breeze from over the water. Many of these people were residents of the rickety tenement across from the model apartments, but one there was who had been unable to leave the small, hot room that she called home, and that one was Mrs. Wilkovich. She was not alone, nor had she been, for all that day Lena May had been at her bedside. She cannot last the night out, the visiting district nurse had said. Hasn't she any own folks to stay with till it's all over? I shall stay, little Lena May had replied. You? Do you think you ought? You're a mere girl. Aren't there some women in this house who do that much for a neighbour? I am seventeen, was the quiet reply, and Mrs. Wilkovich would rather have me. She never made friends among her neighbours. Well, as you wish, the busy nurse had said, I have many more places to visit this evening, so I can't stay. And anyway, there's nothing to do but let her— Bash, please, don't say it. Little Tony might hear. Lena May had implored in a whisper as she glanced at the child curled up on the floor as though he were asleep. When the nurse was gone, Dean Wiggin appeared in the open doorway, as he had many times that day and evening. Nell had been called to the country to see about the small farm which their foster father had bequeathed them, or she would have been with Lena May. Gloria had left at eight to take her evening classes at the settlement, and promised to return at ten and remain with her sister until the end. The giant of a lad with his helpless arm that was always held in one position as it had been in slings so long, glanced first at the woman in the bed, and then at the girl who advanced to him. "'Can't I stay now?' he spoke softly. "'I've closed the shop and the office. Isn't there anything that I can do to help?' "'No, Dean, I don't need you, and there isn't room. But I do wish that you would take Tony out of doors. It's stifling in here.' The little fellow seemed to hear his name. He rose and went to Dean. The lad lifted Tony with his strong right arm. "'I'll take him down to the docks a while,' he told the girl. "'Put a light in the window if you want me.' Lena May said that she would— then, for a time, the young girl stood in the open window, watching the moving lights out on the river. At last she turned back and glanced at the bed. The mother lay so quiet and so white that Lena May believed that she had passed into the land where there is no sweltering, crowded east side. She was right. The tired soul had taken its flight. The girl was about to place the lamp in the window to recall Dean when she paused and listened. What a strange roaring sound she heard, and how intensely hot it was becoming. In another moment there was a wild cry of fire, fire, from the playground. Lena May sprang to the open door. She knew that there was but one fire escape, and that the extreme rear of the long, dark hallway. That very day she noticed that it was piled high with rubbish. Then she must make her escape by the narrow, rickety front stairs. Down the top flight she ran, only to find that the flight beneath her was a seething mass of flame. She darted back into the small room and closed the door. Then she ran to the open window and called for help, but the roaring flames drowned her voice. However, she was seen, and several firemen ran forward with a ladder, but a rear wall crashed in, and they leaped back. At the moment a lad darted up and pushed his way through the crowd. "'Put the ladder up to that window,' he commanded, pointing to where Lena May, pale and quiet, was standing. "'By heck, we won't! It's sure death to climb up there. The wall's rocking even now. Stand back, everybody!' the chief shouted. But one there was who did not obey. With superhuman effort he lifted the ladder. Several men, seeing that he was determined, helped him place it, and then ran back and left the lad to scale it alone. Never before had Dean regretted his useless arm. "'God give me strength!' he cried, then mounted the ladder. He could feel it sway. Flames leapt from the windows as he passed. He caught at the rounds with his left hand as well as his right, and up he went. The girl leaned out. "'Drop down! Hold the window sill. I'll catch you!' the lad called. Lena May did as she was told, and, clinging to the top round with his left hand, Dean clasped the girl's waist with his strong right arm, and climbed down as fast as he could go. He did not realise that he was using his left arm. He had to. It was a matter of life and death. A pain like that made by a hot branding iron shot through his shoulder, but even this he did not know. 
Fireman rushed forward and took the girl from him, and none too soon, for with a terrific roar the fire burst through the roof which caved in, then the wall tottered and crashed down about them. "'Where's that boy, the one that went up the ladder?' people were asking on all sides. Where was he, indeed? End of chapter 29